So, my name is Carl, and I'm from Tax. Who here has heard of Tamex? Yeah, yeah, awesome. I hope you have all heard of Tamex. I mean, the logo's on the line here, guys. Um, cool, so this is what I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to talk to you about Tamex a little bit and Kubernetes briefly, and why those two things together are so happy. Um, we're going to look a little bit on Kubernetes under the hood, because if we want to extend Kubernetes, we kind of need to understand a little bit about that stuff. Then we're going to talk about how do we do this with Python, um, why do I want to have snakes on this control plane, and then we might have some time for Q&A. Um, fun fact, I've only seen the movie Snakes on a Plane once. It was on cable TV in the US, and they censored it, so that famous line, I actually was, I'm tired of these mother flipping snakes on this Monday to Friday airplane. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so, Tamex plus Kubernetes. So, we've all heard of Tamex. Tomix is a global telecommunications provider who sponsors Python this year. Um, so our products are like Elastic Sick Trumping, which is like a voice product to make phone calls. You can uh, buy phone numbers anywhere in the world. You can do programmable messaging. We have wireless, so we have a mobile SIM product that's completely API controlled. We do WebRTC, uh, we've automated networking, all these good things, right? Um, and how this works really is we have a giant global fiber optic network and we have points of presence all over the world. And each point of presence, like what is it? It's uh, a rack with some physical networking equipment that I don't understand on what I touch. And then there's connections to multiple cloud providers. Multiple cloud providers? Yes, multiple cloud providers. So at the minute, Telnix uses Amazon Web Services, Azure, and Google. And it's not just to be cool, there is actually some legit reasons why we do this. Um, the first reason is no cloud provider is available all the places we want to be. Like we want to be as, to, as close to our users as possible and everywhere in the world. Um, not everyone does that. Um, since we're doing real-time communications on the internet, latency is really important. So we try and get like our point of presence close to a major user base, and we try and find cloud providers that are nearby. Um, that reduces the amount of RTT, that the length of time between. Requests. If you just work in the cloud, you don't notice this, but actually latency sucks, uh, so we try and avoid that. And then, um, since we have automated networking, we offer this thing called Virtual Cross Connect. So if you build an application that leverages Telnix, you can automatically network with Telnix. Uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so you have your own private connection, you can get your voice and data, all that good stuff. It's really sweet. Right, okay. And I haven't talked about Kubernetes yet. Right, so Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment and uh, scaling and management of containerized applications. Cool, so that's the definition of their website. Um, but the real main setting points that you want to think about is Kubernetes kind of runs anywhere. You can run it on your laptop, you can run it on your supercomputer cluster, you can run it on the cloud, you can run it wherever. Uh, you can run it on a stack of Raspberry Pis under your desk. Don't do that, but you can. Um, it's self healing, so when you deploy your applications and they crash, Kubernetes puts them back. If the node they're running on explodes or catches fire, it makes a new one and puts your applications there. So that's all cool, and it's really nice that it does that without asking me for help or for my permission. So I don't get woken up. Great, great. And it's also open source, so it has huge community and industry support. And by huge community support, I mean this is the GitHub page from like a few days ago. Um, and you can see the ratio of issues to pull requests is pretty healthy. So it's like 2,000 issues to like 1,000 PRs, that's pretty nice. But then the thing that also blows my mind is there's 2,300 contributors to Kubernetes. So it's absolutely massive. Um, and then if that's not enough to convince your boss to let you play with Kubernetes, there is a huge amount of industry adoption. So if you go to kubernetes.io slash case studies, um, there is all of these companies using Kubernetes. And I mean all of these companies using Kubernetes. And some of these you've heard of, like there's like CERN and the city of Montreal, eBay, Goldman Sachs, Huawei, IBM. <coughs> And the list keeps going on, there's like ING, Monzo, like, and these are all in different industries and different sectors. There doesn't seem to be anything stopping these people from using Kubernetes, like Pokemon Go runs on Kubernetes in person. Um, and then there's other people like Zalando, who we'll come back to in a little while. Right, yeah, and that's cool, but I've heard Kubernetes is really hard to do, and I kind of things that are easy. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff called Kubernetes the hard way. Yeah, okay. So there are some difficult things to do sometimes. Don't let that put you off. Um, if you really, really want to do things the hard way, by all means, there's Kelsey Hightower's uh, Kubernetes the hard way, which has been updated recently for the latest version of Kubernetes. It's like a whole course on GitHub. 
go do that. You'll learn everything the hard way. There's also the Linux Academy off of this as well. Google it. Everyone has a blog post or a medium post or whatever called Kubernetes the hard way. Cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Kubernetes is hard, right? But it doesn't actually have to be hard, right? So who here is using AWS? Who here uses Google Cloud? Who here uses Azure? Womp womp. <laughs> who, here, who here uses something else? If you go to your, your managed service provider, if you're doing something like that, I almost promise you they are offering Kubernetes as a service. Everyone's doing it. So Amazon has EKS, Google has Google Kubernetes Engine, Azure has Azure Kubernetes Service. There's only so many variations on this you can do, right? Uh, there's IBM Cloud Kubernetes Service, Rackspace Kubernetes as a service. DigitalOcean Kubernetes, which just, they gave up. They didn't give it a clever name. They didn't give it a clever marketing slogan. It's Kubernetes. <coughs> um, even Docker as a, their own Docker. The people who invented Docker Swarm seem to have given up, and they're also offering Kubernetes as a service. And you know, maybe you like the misery. I get that, OK? There's lots of other ways to do this. Even if you want to do it the miserable way, there's lots of tools to help you in your misery, right? So there's like Crib, and there's Cube Spray, and there's Chaos that'll help you spin up a Kubernetes cluster. And in the cloud using whatever tools you want. If you're using Mesosphere, DCOS, is anyone using that? Used to. You used to? My oh, apologies. <laughs> uh, but even Mesosphere, I was at KubeCon, and they were like, it's a one click deployment. You can run Kubernetes on Mesosphere. Why? But you can. Uh, there's Overt, there's CloudStack. Even Linode has tooling to let you spin up Kubernetes on bare metal servers on Linode. Uh, so there's all that there, and if you go, if you're one of these people who obsesses about like checking all the options and all the possible configurations and all that good stuff, uh, the Kubernetes docs on setup list everything, like everyone who's offering Kubernetes as a service, everyone who's doing all of these things, and all of your different options. Can you do it on prem? Can you do hybrid? Can you do it entirely in the cloud? Can you do it on a, do a dead badger? Any of that stuff. All of those good things are all there. So don't read that. Just pick it, whatever one works for you, uh, because you'll go crazy trying to weigh up all the options. So Kubernetes as a service is widely available, and after experimenting with many options, like we tried doing it the hard way, we tried using Nomad. Does anyone use Nomad? I know. Literally yesterday, I just turned off all our Nomad infrastructure and we migrated off to Kubernetes. Best day of work ever. Um, so we tried a lot of these different things, and because Telnix is kind of unique, we were kind of like, well, we need a special solution. And it turns out actually using these cloud provider Kubernetes services is super easy, right? And it gives you the best of both worlds, right? If you're trying to build all the infrastructure yourself and work on multiple clouds, you get a little bit of, of what works on every cloud, but you don't get the best of all the clouds, right? Um, it's super easy to make VMs and, and stuff like that, but you end up having to write a bunch of Terraform, and then your Terraform code doesn't work if you're using AWS or whatever, it, it gets messy, right? Whereas this is a really attractive option for us because it leverages all that the clouds offer. So it leverages things like their networking capabilities, their compute uh, abilities, block storage, all of scaling, all that good stuff. And it provides you the same consistent way of running your applications. Um, so if you're looking at doing Kubernetes, do it this way, right? Or at least look at this way first, right? And then see if you've got problems. Right? So let's look at what Kubernetes does under the hood. So Kubernetes is a system that has two components. There's a group of VMs that are running a set of things called the master services, or just they're called the masters. And then you have a bunch of VMs that do all the work. They're the workers. Cool. So the workers are actually pretty straightforward. They run three things. They run this thing called Kubelet, which talks to the Kubernetes cluster. Kube proxy, which runs your networking stack. Kubernetes does some weird networking stuff. That's all Kube proxy. If you want to do custom networking things, that's what's going to change for you. And then your container runtime, which for most people is probably Docker. There's RKT and a bunch of other crap. Um, sorry, a bunch of other <coughs> options. <laughs> right? uh, but all available, they all work, no one cares. And then on the master node, there's a bunch of other services. There's this thing called Kube API server. That's got a great name. All you need to know. There's ETCD, which is like a distributed database. It's like your single source of truth. And um, you have a scheduler <coughs> called Kube Scheduler. It schedules things. And then you have these last two guys at the bottom. Kube Controller Manager and Kube Cloud Controller. Kube Cloud Controller Manager. 
Why am I putting cube in everything now? Um, so, cube or Sorry, it's been a long day. Cube controller manager, it manages the state of things in a weird way. So when you ask Kubernetes for something, it doesn't actually go and do that. It writes it into ECTD, so it gets its source rate, and then it runs like a resolution step where it tries to make your desires happen. So what these two last guys do is, the first one tries to say, I want to deploy 100 instances of my service, and it goes, great, I'm going to try and do that. And it, da, 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 and it follows the rules you've set for it. And when it runs into problems, it goes, oh, I can't deploy 100 of them. I can only deploy 10. And this last guy, Cube Controller Manager, or Cloud Controller Manager, comes along and says, oh, we need more VMs. I'll go make more VMs. And they keep working together um, to, to make this work, right? But how do they all talk to each other? Can anyone tell me? It's all through the API. It all goes through one place. So the one you really have to care about is Cube API Server. Everyone talks their own language, but to talk to each other, it's restful. APIs. Right? Like I said, the API is a collection of APIs, oddly enough, served from the API server. Redundant statement. Um, and it's the glue that kind of holds everything together. So usually when you want to talk to Kubernetes, you just pass an object with your desired state to this API, and it tries to make that a reality. I'm sorry if people don't like YAML or tiny text. It's going to be both, I'm sorry. So this is just asking Kubernetes, hey, I want to deploy Nginx, and I want to run like two versions of it, and it's going to run on port 80. Cool. And the command you need to run then is kubectl, or kubectl, or kubectl, uh, apply dash f, and then file name. That's literally, there's only two commands you really need to know in Kubernetes, and that's one of them. We're halfway to being experts. This looks kind of scary, so let's just break it down. So the first three lines are the most important lines. Um, you're going to see these in every request you make to Kubernetes. They're there. So there's the API version at the first line, and Kubernetes supports multiple API versions, so you need to specify what you want. Um, and then the second one is kind. Kind is kind of like the API object you really want. Like, so we have API version, which versions our APIs. API, the kind that we're suppl is supplying is the, the object state that we want. <coughs> and then there's metadata. Metadata is just metadata. So it's like the name of the application is usually pretty important. Everyone wants a name. Maybe you want to give it some annotations or some labels. Something fun. You can put anything you want in there. It's just key value code. <coughs> and then also the last thing is you need a spec. So this is the specification. This is, hey, Kubernetes, I want this state. But this really depends on what you're supplying, right? And the API is really nice. It supports all of your favorite CRUD operations. And it's actually really straightforward. Um, and there's auto-generated docs that are actually kind of useful. And then what I didn't realize until I started doing this is, the auto-generated docs include like curl examples and there's open swagger and all that other good stuff for open API or whatever it's called now. Um, so it makes it really easy to use. So there's an API, it's rich, it's consistent and logical. What more could you want? Yeah, but but I have a special use case, right? Kubernetes couldn't possibly do the advanced things I needed to do. I need to support flibbity jibbity or whatever. So I can't use Kubernetes. Right, so how do we extend Kubernetes and how do we do it with Python? So we can extend the API whatever way we want. You can supply your own APIs that fit to the API model and they seamlessly integrate as part of Kubernetes. These are typically called custom resource definitions and people normally write these in Golang. There's a bunch of tools to support that. Has anyone done that? One guy, my man. Two guys, two people. Anyone else? Awesome. Why are you at this talk? Okay, uh, we're at Python though, so we need to use Python. So we're going to create a custom resource definition. Again, I'm sorry, tiny text. Um, and we're going to make uh, an object for Python attendees, right? So we're going to call it uh, attendees, right? It's going to be namespaced, and that's just a namespace in Kubernetes is like a logical grouping. Um, it doesn't really mean anything. You can, if you're developing these, segregate stuff by namespace if that's what you want to do. Um, and you have to supply a version and then some names, right? So you have a, it's called an attendee. The plural of attendee is attendees. The singular is attendee. And there's some short names you can give it for fun. So I've used snakes and snake. Cool. And then let's create a custom resource definition. Again, what are the two most important commands in Kubernetes? Apply and delete, right? So we can apply that and it'll create a, a new custom resource definition. And if we want to delete it, it'll delete it, right? 
and then we can make a new Python attendee, right? So we can say queue control apply dash f object dot yaml, and we can get attendees, or we can say get snakes, right? Cool, job done, right? Awesome. What does that actually do? Nothing. So we need to create some Python code to make this work, right? Um, and the nice folks at Zalando came up with this framework called Kopf, which I think is German for head or body. Someone's laughing. Yeah, it's head. Yeah, Manakov. Yeah. Um, so it creates full featured Python operators using, they, they claim just two files, a Docker file and a Python module. If, you, if that's the way you write code, god damn it. Uh, use pip or like requirements.txt. Make your life easy, folks. Come on. Um, cool. So how am I going to demo this? I'm going to skip the demo today because my laptop doesn't want to work. Um, but you need a Kubernetes cluster, right, to do this, right? And like that Amazon stuff you were talking about earlier on, that costs some money. So yeah. And there's a few different ways you can run a Kubernetes cluster, right? So there's Minikube. Minikube creates a Kubernetes cluster on your box using vir on your machine using VirtualBox. Um, that's kind of slow, and if you're like me, your laptop cries every time you start another VM on it. There's other options. There's micro PADS, which is like a native single node Kubernetes cluster from Canonical. If you use Ubuntu, every time you log into Ubuntu server, it advertises this to you as the message of the day. I've never used it. Good job on the advertising Canonical. Uh, and then there's Kind, which is Kubernetes and Docker. Um, this is actually the officially supported way from Kubernetes for supporting um, testing the local the local testing and like continuous integration and stuff like that. Um, so for this demo that I'm not going to do, but here's what the command looks like, you can say kind. And you can like say, hey, help. This is what the help looks like. And it's pretty simple. Like you go build, uh, create, delete, export, help, whatever. Uh, and when you run it, it just you know does a few things. Again, tiny text, I'm sorry. Uh, but it downloads the correct version of Kubernetes. It spins up multiple Kubernetes nodes that nodes in Docker. It's running Docker and Docker. And I don't know how everyone feels about that. Um, yeah, and it sets up some stuff for you. So it sets up this control plane that we've been talking about. It starts CNI, which I'll talk about later on, uh, and storage class, which gets mentioned later on as well. Uh, and then you just need to tell uh, your kube control don't use whatever is in my current kubeconfig, use this guy instead. So export kubeconfig and then uh, the path to where my Kubernetes node lives, and then you can just use it as it is. Super simple. This, by the way, is like a Golang program. It's just a simple binary. It's like one file. Really nice to use. So our code in Kopf, we're just going to do three simple functions. Create, update, delete. That's all we need. This is actually a Kubernetes operator. Um, so we import Kopf. Uh, Kopf, I think, needs uh, Python 3.7 at least, or 3.6. We're all not using 2.7 anymore, right? That got one laugh. That's, <laughs> that's really worrying. We're all using 3.6, right? Yes. Yes? Until the end of Christmas. Until the end of Christmas, so you're using 2.7. <laughs> you work for a security company. I, I use 3.8, so I use 3.6. <laughs> oh, that makes me sad. Anyway, so if you're using 3.7 or like 3.6, there's some really nice stuff, including Kopf. Um, so we're just going to do like three simple functions. Uh, and what we get passed in is the meta, so the first few lines of your file. The spec, it'll pass a namespace, a logger, and then some more keyword arguments that I wasn't bothered to look up. And this just logs. And then the command to run it is cough run the name of your file, which in my case is pycon.ie dash dash verbose. Is that all it does? It's pretty boring. Demo time, which you know, we'll skip um, because my laptop is not being properly today. Um, but why on earth do you want to help? Why do, why do you want to do this, right? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so as I skipped over in my demo, you can take Kubernetes to strange new places with this. This allows you to extend the native functionality. You can integrate your own components. You can take applications that are really difficult to deploy and manage and just give people an operator and give them like one simple file. Hey, you make this YAML file, it'll give you everything you need, right? Um, so you can automatically, like you have some annoying application you need to deploy. Give me an annoying application we all hate. What's the thing we all, we all don't like right now? 
Jenkins. Jenkins. <laughs> okay, so actually, so there is actually a really good Jenkins operator for, for Kubernetes. Don't take my word oh, for it. Tableau. Sorry? Tableau. Tableau? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything with Tableau. I don't know to say anything bad with Tableau, but maybe you've got Tableau and you want everyone to have their own instance of Tableau and learn to manage it for each team. You can make a Tableau operator and it installs Tableau and all of its dependencies. And then when someone doesn't want their Tableau instance anymore, the life cycle. So we can go back to that code we just saw. <coughs> Update, delete, whatever. And you can just see on the top, right? Cough on delete. So when someone says, hey, delete this, this is the function to call. Cough on update, do this. And I don't know if anyone else noticed this, but there's this like weird thing going on here. I'm trying to mouse point on this. is like python.ie.tendies. Like, it seems kind of a bit strange, right? I made this thing, and I told Kubernetes, hey, I made a custom resource definition, and now I'm writing code to handle that, and the two don't really seem very tightly coupled. Um, I wonder if we can use that for something else, right? Uh, just some more examples of really good operators. The Prometheus operator and Rook. Uh, Rook, like, manages, if you've ever used Ceph, the storage driver. Yeah, Ceph is really complicated. Use Rook. Um, so if you want to reinvent the wheel, though, we can just go back to that code we just saw, the create, update, delete, and we can just change those, those strings that we saw in the decorator to be anything we want, right? You can make it listen to updates for other functions, other code. You can make it print something every time you see someone do a new deployment. You can make sure no one ever runs a bad version of a certain container or a certain object in your cluster by listening to all the events and filtering them out manually. It's actually pretty straightforward. Um, and if there's enough interest in people reinventing the wheel in Kubernetes, if there's some job that lots of people want to do or offer, um, the Kubernetes community is pretty open to special interest groups. So you get together with other people and you make a special interest group. Um, so the two most common ones are the two ones that really have changed Kubernetes in the last maybe two years to 18 months are uh, CSI, the contain or container storage interface, and there's uh, CNI, the cloud networking interface. So before that, everyone was kind of just on their own. Everyone was like, well, I want Kubernetes to use my storage provider. So I want Kubernetes to use Elastic Block Store, or I'm on-prem and I want Kubernetes to use Ceph, or I'm using something else. Um, so people would go invent their own storage driver. And it's actually pretty easy to make Kubernetes provision and delete storage for you. Um, but all of the other storage related things, it has no idea. So someone came up with this container storage interface. And that allows you to do all the lifecycle events for your storage, including like resizing and stuff like that, which no one supports. Um, and all you have to do is just implement this and Kubernetes then magically talks the same language. Everything just kind of works. You scale in, you scale up, you scale up, you scale down. Everyone happy. And the same thing with networking, right? Lots of people want exotic networking models. Does anyone here run Container Router? Does anyone know what Container Router is? Container router is a nightmare. It's BGP inside a container, and then a BGP peers to the host, and that peers to the internet. Um, we do that at Tonix. It's not something like, it's, it's something we do. It's not the best thing we do, but it solves some problems if you want to have any cast. Or maybe you want to do some exotic networking thing. It's kind of weird. Um, so to support that, there's the cloud networking interface. Um, and that means now that your container can just use whatever networking setup that you've set up for the whole cluster. And you don't need to configure any magic inside your container. Um, typically on the cloud service providers, that's Kubernetes as a service, each one of your instances of your service is called a pod, and each one of those pods gets uh, its own private IP address from a CIDR you supply. 